is Myron C. Fagan. During the past 20 years of my more than 60 years of experience on Broadway and in Hollywood, as a playwright, director, and producer, I have received many thousands of letters from fans and worshippers of the movie stars who have been identified by congressional committees and the FBI as collaborators in the Red Conspiracy to destroy our country, asking me why and how their idols have become Reds, and pleading with me to assure them that it is not true. Unfortunately, and regretfully, I cannot give them that assurance. I say regretfully because the vast majority of those red stars have been my close friends through all the years that I have been on Broadway and in Hollywood. But in this recording, I will endeavor to show how and why they joined in the red conspiracy. The most thrilling and most glamorous phase of life in our country always has been the world of entertainment. At the turn of the century, that world of entertainment was primarily the living theater, Broadway. In 1907, I became a part of that world as a playwright, director, and producer. Then some years later came the movies, and a new glamour world came into existence. It was called Hollywood. But until 1930, Broadway was my world. Then as the movies were transformed into what they then called the talkies, I came to Hollywood. As a result, I came to know both worlds well. During all the years from 1907, practically every known star, from Mrs. Leslie Carter, Douglas Fairbanks, Helen Morgan, Clark Gable, and many others, appeared in one or more of my plays and films or under my direction. All of them were close friends. Then in 1945, I suddenly discovered that Hollywood, the land of glamour, had become a cesspool of treason that many of those glamorous stars, writers, directors, and producers were the backbone of a horrifying communist conspiracy and were deliberately using their very glamour and the screen to glorify communism in Moscow and to create an ugly American conception of America and the American people throughout the world. Until that year of 1945, I did not have the slightest suspicion that many of those close friends and associates were as deep in the commission of treason as Alger Hiss. Tragically for me, in my eyes, their treason was even more heinous because they were employing the unsuspecting adoration of their worshippers to poison tip the daggers they were plunging into their backs. True? During the early 1940s, I was puzzled and actually bewildered when I saw Mission to Moscow, produced by Warner Brothers, Song of Russia, produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, North Star, produced by Samuel Goldwyn, all of them wildly enthusiastic about the glorious way of life in liberal communist Russia. But I accepted the explanation of the producers that those films were merely gestures to our then wartime ally. But later, when I saw the doctored versions of the same films that were exhibited all over the world, versions that depicted Moscow as the world's only hope against a decadent America, and learned that the doctoring had been approved by the producers, by our State Department, and by Franklin Roosevelt, I began to smell a rat. A lot of rats. At this point, so as to leave nothing to imagination, let me tell you exactly how this treason by our most beloved people was launched. In the collective mind of all of the American people, Broadway and Hollywood has always stood for theater, entertainment. It was a world apart, peopled by pixies who until the 1920s lived and breathed nothing but grease paint and makeup box. Their world was bounded by the stage door on the one side and the footlights on the other. They were dedicated only to amusement and entertainment. Then in the early 1920s, a sinister force began to creep its way into that harmless make-believe world, to transform its pixies into evil pipe pipers who were to lead the American people out of the freedoms of the American way of life into the swamp of communism. Last July in 1967, we issued a set of recordings three two-sided records which we call the Illuminati CFR Conspiracy, in which I reveal the entire great conspiracy to transform the United States into an enslaved unit of a United Nations One World Government. In those recordings I revealed with documentary proof that the conspirators had the United States marked down for conquest since as far back as 1917. 
But the conspirators knew that they could not hope for success unless they could first break down our defenses and resistive powers from within. A frontal attack, such as enslaved the Russian people, could not succeed over here. The American people would first have to be conditioned to realize the wonders of Marxism. In other words, we, the American people, would have to be deluded and mesmerized. But that job would have to be done very subtly, so as not to arouse suspicions too soon. That poison would have to be hypoed into the American bloodstream by the least suspected needle, a glamorous sugar-tipped needle. The press, while necessary, could not be that needle, because it was bound to be more or less obvious. The soapbox orator, while of value, would have to do his work without cover. But who would suspect the devil-may-care, happy-go-lucky, beloved pixie of the make-believe world? Thus, in 1920, the conspirators operating in Moscow organized what they called the Cinema Bureau of the International Union of the Revolutionary Theater. Their chief objective was to, I quote, unite the creative and technical workers of the film industry in America on an international scale to create revolutionary films in all countries, unquote. The reason for their stress on the film is because one film can be shown simultaneously in a thousand theaters and reach millions in the time a stage play would reach only thousands. But the legitimate stage and the then infant radio were to be made captive too, all at the same time. In fact, the further directive stipulated that the entire infiltration was to be started through the legitimate theater because they, the conspirators, realized that the big names on Broadway would have necessity become the big names in the then infant Hollywood. The details of how the conspirators successfully infiltrated both Broadway and Hollywood and how they seduced the stars, writers, directors, and producers into becoming their treasonous pipe pipers is too lengthy for inclusion in this record. I will come back to that in subsequent recordings. But to remove all doubts about the authenticity of what I will now tell you, it is highly important to show you how I had discovered that our beloved Hollywood by 1945 had become transformed into the craftiest, the most brazen, the most poisonous, the most dangerous carrier of communist propaganda of all of our mass communications media. Sleeton were the Reds in Hollywood, among them some of the greatest and most beloved idols of the American people. It was early in 1945 that I made my tragic discovery. I was in New York directing a new play. During the rehearsals, I was visited by an old friend of mine, John T. Flynn, a famous journalist and author of several sensational books, among them The Roosevelt Myth, While We Slept, and The Truth About Pearl Harbor. The objective of his visit was to urge me to attend a special meeting set up for me for the following Sunday in Senator Vandenberg's office in Washington. I was puzzled. I hadn't been active in journalism or in politics for many years, and I couldn't understand why I was thus summoned to Washington. John did not tell me what the meeting was all about. He preferred that I should find out for myself. He simply said it was terrifically important, that it would be the most important event in my entire life. My faith in John was supreme, so late Saturday afternoon I went to Washington. At that meeting in Washington, I was told the entire story of what had happened at the top secret meetings in Yalta, attended by Franklin Roosevelt, Alger Hiss, and Harry Hopkins, representing our government, and Joe Stalin, Molotov, and Vyshinsky, representing Moscow, with Chip Rowland serving as interpreter. It was the horrifying story of how the American traitors deliberately delivered all the nations in the Balkans and Eastern Europe to Moscow and how they set the plans to deliver mainland China to communist control. Furthermore, Vandenberg and the others at that meeting, which included other congressmen and top officials of Army and Navy Intelligence and the FBI, had documentary proof for their story. They had microfilms and recordings of all the meetings, secretly made by Stalin, to be used as a club over Roosevelt's head should Roosevelt ever try to renege on his part of the betrayals. The underground in Russia had managed to get copies of both the microfilms and the recordings. 
They sent two sets of both to the United States. One set to one of our intelligence agencies, another set to Senator Vandenberg. I was stunned and horrified by what I heard and saw, but that wasn't the only thing I learned at that meeting. I learned how utterly and completely all our mass communications media were controlled by the masterminds of the great conspiracy to destroy our country. These masterminds of the great conspiracy are known as the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, as the Illuminati is now known in our country. Immediately after Vandenberg and the others viewed those microfilms and recordings, they had called a press conference. Virtually all newspaper correspondents in Washington and heads of the Associated Press and the UPI, amongst others, were present. After revealing the entire story to them, Vandenberg asked them to front page that entire act of treason. The answer was an emphatic no. Some of the correspondents frankly admitted they wouldn't even dare to mention that they had so much as seen the films or heard the recordings, that even a mention of it would mean their jobs and their careers. Thereupon Vandenberg called in the heads of NBC, ABC, CBS, and other broadcasting channels and asked them to reveal the story on the air. He got the same emphatic no. The radio people pointed out that the Federal Communications Commission was controlled by the Roosevelt administration and the CFR, who could and would cancel their licenses if they uttered one word about that Yalta treason plot. At that point, Vandenberg hit upon a truly brilliant idea. He remembered what a terrific impact the film Mission to Moscow had made in the whole world. He realized that the Yalta story, as revealed by the microfilms and recordings, would make an even more terrific film. Thereupon, he, accompanied by other members of Congress, flew to Hollywood. The first man they approached was Harry M. Warner, head of Warner Brothers. Vandenberg reminded Warner of his frightfully grave injustice to our country and the American people when he produced Mission to Moscow in which he had glorified Moscow and communism and horribly denigrated America and the American people. Now, Mr. Warner, said the senator, you have a wonderful opportunity to undo that wrong by making a film of the true story of the Yalta betrayals. Warner's amazing reply was, gentlemen, forget about the communists. They are very fine people. Just keep on fighting the Nazis and the fascists. Bear in mind, that was after the war, and there were no Nazis and fascists left to fight. Communism was our only menace. At this point, I wish to stress a very horrifying fact. That film, Mission to Moscow, was made from a book of that same name, supposedly written by our then American ambassador to Moscow, Joseph E. Davies. Actually, it was written by two Russians in the Kremlin and our renegade ambassador, Davies, had agreed to pose as the author and have it published under his name in the United States. And, according to Harry Warner, the Warner Brothers made that film on direct orders from the White House and from the internationalist bankers, members of the Illuminati CFR cabal, who controlled the Warner Brothers lot, who practically control all the lots in Hollywood. Now can you see the fiendish plot behind the making of that Mission to Moscow film? How could anybody who saw that film doubt the authenticity of the glory of Moscow and the communism and the horrible decadence of the United States and the American people as depicted in a film written and produced by so-called distinguished Americans? After the Warner turned down, Vandenberg went to Louis B. Mayer whose MGM had produced Song of Russia, which had similarly glorified Russia and communism and denigrated America. Mayer gave him, in so many words, the same answer. Vandenberg then approached other Hollywood producers who had made and were making similar communist propaganda films. But everywhere he went, he got the same answer. Thereupon, Vandenberg decided upon another method. He decided that a legitimate play could serve the same purpose. True, a play would not have the instantaneous nationwide sensation that a film would create, but it would be a good starting point. He went to New York and broached the matter to several Broadway producers. But the moment he mentioned the subject, all those producers ran like thieves in the night. Some, such as Herman Shumlin, 
rejected the idea of such a play because they themselves were pro-communists. Others, such as Lee Schubert, were scared to death in fear of what the powers behind the great conspiracy would do to their theaters. And that was when Vandenberg went to John T. Flynn, whom he knew as a great patriot, and asked him if he knew of any playwright who could write, direct, and produce a play that would reveal that entire Yalta treason plot. And John replied, Senator, you are asking for a miracle man, a miracle man with the guts of a lion. I know of only one such man. Now you know how and why I attended that meeting in Washington. But as Al Jolson used to say, wait, you ain't heard nothing yet. What Vandenberg wanted me to do was to write a play that would be a great evening of entertainment, but not as a fictional story, but a true life story, and to name the traitors who had participated in the treason committed in those secret meetings in Yalta. Frankly, and speaking in the vernacular, that request, which was really a demand, knocked me for a loop. I pointed out that naming such men as Roosevelt, Hopkins, Alger Hiss, who had not yet been exposed as a Moscow spy, and was then being acclaimed as the hero founder of the great United Nations to ensure peace, would lay me wide open to libel suits and, but before I could say and wreck my career, Vandenberg broke in with, that's exactly what I hope will happen. Such libel suits could not be ignored by the press. It would automatically reveal the entire great conspiracy and it would torpedo the United Nations as the proposed housing for their one world government. I recognized the truism of Vandenberg's statement and I knew that I would be provided with plenty of defense against libel suits, because truth cannot be considered libelous. Nevertheless, the idea of writing such a play stunned me. Having already been told how all the Hollywood moguls and Broadway producers viewed the entire matter, I realized that the moment I'd write such a play, every lot in Hollywood would be closed to me. Ditto Broadway. I was faced with the hardest decision of my entire life. In addition, aside from my willingness to place my own career on the line, there were two other people whose futures would be at stake. My wife and my son, Bruce. Therefore, I had to delay my decision until I could put the entire situation before them, which I did upon my return to my home in Hollywood. I told my wife that I was quite sure that if I wrote and produced such a play, I would be blacklisted both in Hollywood and on Broadway. I pointed out that there would be no more lush salaries from the film industry, no lush royalties from my plays, that she'd have to forego all the luxuries she had become accustomed to in all the previous years of our marriage. Her simple response was, did I ever ask you for all those luxuries? Loyalty to God and country came first with her. Frankly, I fully expected that kind of reaction from her. She was that kind of a woman, God rest her soul. My son Bruce had been associated with my theatrical activities. He could look forward to a great career, but his response was exactly the same as his mother's. He didn't hesitate for one moment. Loyalty to God and country came first with him too, and that too I had fully expected. Thereupon I went to work on the writing of the play, which I decided I would call Red Rainbow. I completed it within a matter of weeks, and then I left for New York to arrange for a cast and for a theater. The first man I approached was Lee Schubert. At that time, the Schuberts owned and controlled most of the theaters in New York and throughout the nation. I had known Lee from the time I first came to Broadway in 1907. Through the years that followed, I had had very close business relationships with him, had booked all my plays into his theaters, and we had become close and warm friends. When I asked him to assign a theater for a new play I had just completed, his first question was, is it for Red Rainbow? I was greatly surprised, because I had not mentioned the title of the play to anybody except the Vandenberg Group. But obviously the name of the play and its subject had been leaked by somebody. Naturally, I had to admit that the play was Red Rainbow. Lee promptly produced a sheaf of letters and telegrams, all warning him that if he permitted Red Rainbow or any anti-communist play to be staged in one of his theaters, all his theaters would be stench-bound, and he urgently advised me to forget Red Rainbow. I was terrifically disappointed, but not deterred. 
I contacted other theater owners whom I knew to be loyal Americans, but all had been similarly intimidated and like Schubert, they all urged me to forget Red Rainbow, but I was still determined to go ahead. I figured I could get an off-Broadway theater on an outright rental basis, and I began the job of lining up a cast for the play. I spoke with a number of top Broadway actors, many of whom I had employed in my many other plays, but I quickly learned that all of them had been warned that their appearance in Red Rainbow would mean the end of their careers. At the same time, two prominent newspaper dramatic critics with whom I had had friendly relationships came to see me. They told me that on orders from the top, whatever that meant, they would be forced to tear Red Rainbow to shreds in their reviews and simultaneously tear me to shreds. Both of them urged me to forget Red Rainbow because if I persisted, in producing it, it would mean the end of my career. So now I knew what a frighteningly complete control the Reds had on the legitimate theater. And I knew that all doors of Broadway were closed to Red Rainbow. However, I am a very stubborn man, especially when it comes to loyalty to my country. I decided to take the play back to Hollywood. In the Hollywood colony, I had many hundreds of friends, stars and top actors, many of whom had appeared in my plays and films. I felt very confident that in Hollywood I would be able to get a theater and a good cast of actors. I had not yet learned that Actors' Equity Association, the Actors' Union, had spread word to all members to shun Red Rainbow like a case of smallpox, all of which goes to show how naive I was at that time, how little I knew of the Red Conspiracy in the entertainment world, how little I knew of the overall great conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of our nation. Because the moment I mentioned Red Rainbow in Hollywood, the very same things that happened on Broadway were duplicated in Hollywood, only more so. Every theater owner, every actor, trembled with fear at the very mention of Red Rainbow. On top of that, some of my closest friends in the industry confidentially informed me that I had been tried in absentia by the Hollywood moguls, some of whom I had considered my very good friends, and the verdict was that if I persisted in my efforts to produce Red Rainbow, I would be a dead duck on every lot in Hollywood. Realizing that I was butting my head against the stone wall, I surrendered. That is, I decided to forget about Red Rainbow for the time being. But I did not give up my determination to expose the Yalta treason. I decided to write a new play in which I would do the very same kind of exposing, but to avert all suspicions, I gave this new play a very innocuous title. I called it Thieves' Paradise. The plot or story of this new play was all about a domestic problem of a family living in Bulgaria. It was a distinctly humorous story. Anyway, the first two acts were. To those who were familiar with my writing style, Thieves' Paradise sounded like some of my earlier comedies, such as The Little Spitfire, The Siren, Miss Mates. And I very carefully but innocently spread the word that it was just that kind of a play. This time I had no difficulty getting a theater, which I rented outright and engaged my own staff to operate it with my son Bruce serving as the producing manager. Likewise, this time I had no difficulty getting a cast, but I picked that cast very carefully engaging actors and actresses whom I knew to be zealously loyal to America. Now, the important point about Thieves' Paradise was that, while the first two acts were distinctly comedy drama and contained no indication of the exposition of the Yalta United Nations plottings, the third act was devoted entirely to the exposition. Therefore, I did not allow anybody, not even my scene designer, to read the manuscript in its entirety. I had a special reason for that precaution. Under the Actors' Equity Association rulings, the first week of rehearsals was, to all intents and purposes, a probationary period. During that first week, any actor who found his part undesirable could serve notice on the producer and withdraw from the play. The same ruling applied to the producer, who, if he felt an actor had been miscast, could replace the actor. But after that probationary week, that was, to all intents and purposes, a probationary period. During that first week, any actor who found his part undesirable could serve notice on the producer and an actor had been miscast could replace the actor. But after that probationary week, the saying goes, all hell broke loose. 
word got out that although Thieves' Paradise was not Red Rainbow, it was to do the very job of exposition I had intended to do with Red Rainbow. But it was too late to stop me. But the Reds did not surrender. During the following week, all the actors in the cast were harassed by anonymous phone calls, especially all through the nights, threatening them and their families with dire consequences, even assassination, unless they would pull out of the play. Naturally, I received similar warnings, but we all disregarded all threats. However, one night, a few days before the opening performance, somebody tried to run our star, Michael Whalen, off a cliff on his way home after a rehearsal. He reported that to me the next morning. It infuriated me, and I blurted out, if that's the way they want to play this game, I'll play it that way too. And I stated that on the opening night after the last curtain, I would deliver a curtain speech in which I would reveal the entire Red conspiracy in Hollywood and name 100 of the Red Star's writers and directors who were the backbone of the conspiracy. That statement was brought to the attention of Jimmy Fiddler, then the most prominent radio commentator in Hollywood. Jimmy phoned me and asked me if I really would deliver such a curtain speech. I asked him why he wanted to know. He replied, if you will really do it, I will devote my entire Sunday night broadcast to it. Thereupon I assured him that I would. Then he said he understood that I would name 100 top stars, writers, and directors as Reds. I told him that was correct. Jimmy was amazed. He didn't know there were that many Reds in Hollywood. He said, do you realize that under California law you could be subjected to criminal libel suits? I said, I knew it. He then said, are any of the people you will name really important stars? I said, well, I don't know if you consider them important, but among those I will name are Eddie Cantor, Edward G. Robinson, Catherine Hepburn, Gene Kelly, Gregory Peck. Wow, exclaimed Jimmy. Do you have any documentary proof that they are Reds? I assured him I had plenty. At this point, I will digress for a moment to clarify that documentary proof matter. At that meeting in Washington, I was informed by FBI agents and members of the House Committee on Un-American Activities that it was commonly known that there was a widespread communist conspiracy in the world of entertainment, particularly in Hollywood, but they could not institute an investigation until they could get documentary proof to warrant a congressional hearing. And even the FBI admitted that they had been unable to break through the Iron Curtain around Hollywood. Such proof could be obtained only by someone inside the industry. Well, of course, I was very much inside in Hollywood. So during the weeks that I was working on my plays, I quietly began to gather such proof as photostatic copies of membership cards in the Communist Party and other communist activities. And to give credit where it is due, I got a lot of help from Adolf Manju, Clark Gable, Rupert Hughes, and other loyal Americans in the Hollywood colony. So that by the time I was talking with Jimmy Fiddler, I had acquired documentary proof of red activities by more than 300 Hollywood celebrities. Among them, Dalton Crumble, John Howard Lawson, John Houston, Gershwin, etc., all of which I naturally turned over to Senator Jack B. Tenney, then chairman of the California State Senate Fact-Finding Committee, Parnell Thomas, chairman of the Congressional Committee, and the FBI. Now let's go back to that opening night curtain speech. True to his promise, on the Sunday night before the opening performance of Thieves' Paradise, Jimmy Fiddler did devote his broadcast to the subject. It came in the form of a warning to the Los Angeles Police Department the sheriff's office and the American Legion to guard the El Patio Theater on the following night as Pearl Harbor should have been guarded because he had had information that the Reds would prevent the play from going on even if they would have to bomb the theater out of existence. That broadcast created a terrific sensation. Hours before the curtain was to go up, Hollywood Boulevard in the vicinity of the theater was so crowded that the police had to divert all traffic and the American Legion responded to Fiddler's warning. In the patio of the theater, there were 16 stands of colors, each one guarded by four legionnaires in full uniform, armed with rifles, ready for any trouble. In accordance with my promise, immediately after the final curtain was dropped, 
I delivered my curtain speech in which I clearly revealed the entire Red Conspiracy and named 100 of the top stars, writers, directors, and producers who composed the backbone of that conspiracy. Now bear in mind, until that night, more than 99% of the American people had not had the slightest knowledge that their idols had been involved in this heinous, treasonous conspiracy. So you can imagine the horrifying shock that rocked that audience when I named the following great celebrities as the guilty ones. I don't have enough space to name all of them, but here are a few of them. First of all, I named Charlie Chaplin, who together with a full dozen other top stars had signed a secret radiogram to Joe Stalin, pledging allegiance to the Soviet Union. I followed with Lucille Ball, whose home had for years been the headquarters for the chief Hollywood Red activists. Then I named Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart, Marlon Brando, Lloyd Bridges, Eddie Cantor, Lee J. Cobb, Joseph Cotton, Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, Kirk Douglas, Melvin Douglas, Florence Eldridge, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Jose Ferrer, Henry Fonda, Ava Gardner, Paulette Goddard, Rita Hayworth, Van Heflin, Paul Henry, Catherine Hepburn, Lena Horne, Marsha Hunt, Chet Huntley, John Ireland, Burl Ives, George Jessel, Danny Kaye, Gene Kelly, Burt Lancaster, Peter Laurie, Myrna Loy, Frederick March, Groucho Marx, Burgess Meredith, Henry Morgan, Paul Muni, Gregory Peck, Vincent Price, Edward G. Robinson, Robert Ryan, Pete Seeger, Frank Sinatra, French Tone, Orson Welles, Keenan Wynn, Leonard Bernstein, Harold Thurman, Stanley Kramer, Mark Connolly, Norman Corwin, Carl Foreman, Ira Gershwin, Johnny Green, Ben Hecht, John Houston, Garson Kanan, Elia Kazan, Louis Milestone, Norman Mailer, Arthur Miller, Clifford Odets, Dorothy Parker, Otto Preminger, Dory Sharry, Bud Schulberg, Howard K. Smith, Donald Ogden Stewart, Billy Wilder, and Langston Hughes, infamous for his poem, Goodbye Christ, plus the later infamous Hollywood Ten, headed by Dalton Trumbo, John Howard Lawson, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitrik, etc., etc. All of them were later convicted at the congressional hearing in Washington. At the same time, I named the following viciously treasonous red fronts many of them had organized and directed, such as American-Soviet Friendship, Hollywood Anti-Nazi League, Institute for Democratic Action, Independent Citizens Committee of Arts, Sciences, and Professions, American Committee for Protection of Foreign Born, Film Audiences for Democracy, Young People's Records, Hollywood League for Democratic Action, Motion Picture Artists Committee, etc., etc. At least 70 of the Reds I named in my speech were in the audience. I dared all of them to challenge my charges and to sue me if it ain't so. None of them challenged me. Not one of them ever sued me. I won't go into the details of how the press critics reviled the play. That was fully expected. They had openly stated in advance that they would. No matter how well written or directed or acted the play would be. But my speech hit the front pages all over the country. It was aired by radio commentators, all, of course, blasting me as a liar and anti-Semite. But it also promptly activated Congressman Parnell Thomas, then chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. He flew to Hollywood and hauled in for questioning some of the Red Stars I had named in my speech. He also talked with some of the more courageous pro-American stars. Then he held a preliminary hearing in Los Angeles. What he heard gave him sufficient grounds to call for a thorough investigation by the entire Congressional Committee in public hearings in Washington. Hollywood exploded. The Reds defied Thomas. They vilified him and threatened that if he went through with the hearings, they would destroy him politically. And as we know, they did. 
But Parnell Thomas was a man of great courage and loyal to his country. He went right ahead with his plans for the hearings. The Hollywood Reds had been fiendishly clever through all the years in which they had gradually enslaved the entire industry. But apparently their success had gone to their heads. They decided to declare an open fight on Thomas and on the entire Congressional Committee. First of all, they organized their infamous Committee for the First Amendment, the most vicious of all the Red Fronts in Hollywood. This was done at a meeting at the home of Lewis Milestone, one of the top Red Commissars in Hollywood. William Z. Foster, then head of the Communist Party in the United States and spokesman for Uncle Joe Stalin, came on from New York to personally mastermind the proceedings. Next, this new committee launched a full-page advertising campaign in all theatrical trade papers and fan magazines in which the Congressional Committee was violently attacked and flayed for, quote, interfering with the freedom of the individual, unquote. And the press all over the country supported their claims with front-page editorials. Following that, they launched a two-hour radio broadcast. All of the Hollywood Red Stars participated in it, plus many non-Reds who were actually blackmailed into contributing their presence and talents. It was a nationwide broadcast, a perfervid appeal to all their millions of brainwashed fans and worshippers. They, the Red Stars, screamed their righteous indignation and branded the impending hearings in Washington not as an investigation of treasonous red activities in the film industry, but as an invasion of the privacy of all of the American people and a threat to the freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution. And amazingly, their fans believed them. So brainwashed were they by their idolatry and by the press and radio. Many, many thousands of otherwise loyal Americans wrote blistering wires and letters to the Congressional Committee and to their own representatives and senators, also to their newspapers and weekly news magazines, and all those letters were published. In addition, the liberal press editors and columnists joined in the outcry against the Congressional monsters. Ditto radio commentators. But Parnell Thomas ignored the entire commotion and calmly continued to serve subpoenas to the Red Stars, writers, directors, and producers, who denied they were Reds, insisted that they were just liberals. And then the Hollywood hierarchy made their biggest mistake. They decided to put on a show at the hearings, a show that would, in the lingo of tough guy Humphrey Bogart, make a monkey of Thomas and his whole congressional committee. At that that didn't sound like a far-fetched threat. After all, they had all the great actors in Hollywood to choose from for a burlesque of that sort. Who would better know how to ridicule and needle those congressmen? Who would better know how to jive and jeer and inflame an audience, all of the American people, against those congressional monsters? Thus, on the eve of the hearings, a plane load of Hollywood's most glamorous red stars, headed by Danny Kaye, Gregory Peck, Lauren Bacall, all field marshaled by bold bad man Bogart, landed at the Washington airport, heralded in advance by Washington's Post and Star, themselves as liberal as any of the Hollywood Reds, a great crowd of their movie fans were on hand to greet and welcome their idols. Simultaneously, the entire nation's press and radio were making a great to-do about that great crusade by the people's Red Darlings. Danny Kaye, fancying himself as quite a Mark Antony, delivered in oration, as did Bogart and the others, and then all those brave and treasonous would-be emancipators from congressional tyranny marched through densely crowded streets and cheering mobs to their battlefront in the balcony of the hearing room in the old house office building. But lo and behold, at the hearing everything went awry. Without a script and director to guide them, the Hollywood clack jibed and jeered at the wrong times and cheered the wrong individuals. The brainwashed fans who had come there to cheer their idols, disillusioned and disgusted, began to hiss and boo. From that point, everything went from bad to worse. The friendly witnesses, stars and writers, whom the Red Hierarchy had cast in roles of villainy, told the true story of the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood and emerged as heroes. The Reds, particularly the infamous Hollywood Ten, whom the same Hollywood hierarchy had projected as heroes in the piece, came out covered with infamy and penitentiary sentences. 
Then to complete the debacle, the press and radio, who with great eagerness had come there to ridicule the committee, were forced to reverse themselves and publish far and wide the guilt of the Red Stars. Pardon me, I mean liberals. Thus, practically in a matter of minutes, the Reds wrecked a perfect treason machine they had been secretly building in Hollywood for 25 years. So secretly had they been building it, the American people not only had no suspicion of it, but had actually been making it possible by their patronage at the box offices, thus financing films that were poisoning the minds of our youth and brainwashing all the people of the whole world. But we, the people, are slow to learn. That first congressional investigation left me with three inescapable conclusions. Number one, it provided concrete evidence that the short memory of our people is the greatest menace to the very life of our country. Number two, that the CFR controlled communications media are directly responsible for that short memory, as I will later show. Number three, that the Reds never quit. In that year, 1947, Everybody old enough to read was made fully aware of the vile treason committed by the Reds in Hollywood. Each and every day of those hearings, the press throughout our nation front-paged every detail of that horrifying story. They didn't dare to ignore it or play it down because more than 300 stars, writers, directors, and producers were officially declared guilty. It not only shocked the people, it enraged them. But practically, the very day after those hearings ceased, both the press and the radio went into deep silence, and tragically, the people proceeded to forget all about it. In anticipation that that would happen, during the weeks preceding the hearings in Washington, I appeared before various women's clubs and various patriotic groups, and in my speeches I predicted that the hearings would create a nationwide sensation. I predicted that the press would not dare to ignore the facts that would be brought out at those hearings. But I also warned that both the press and the radio would go into complete silence after the hearings would close, and I warned my audiences against the tragic propensity of the people to forget. I also warned that the Reds never quit. One very wonderful result came out of my speeches and warnings. Under the leadership of Mrs. J. Henry Orme of the Ebell Women's Club, a very wonderful patriotic American woman, 100 presidents of women's clubs in Southern California, particularly in the Hollywood area, met and organized what they called Citizens United for American Principles. Those women's clubs' presidents agreed to serve as a committee of 100 directors of the organization, and they appointed Rupert Hughes, a famous writer and uncle of Howard Hughes, to serve as their advisory chairman. Their objective was as simple as it could have been highly effective. That objective was to urge all loyal Americans to boycott all movie theaters that would continue to show red propaganda films and films employing the 300 reds named and officially identified by the Congressional Committee. That would destroy the box offices of those theaters and thus destroy the revenues of all the red conspiracy's producers. True, that might destroy the entire film industry, but it would also break the back of the entire red conspiracy. To save themselves, it would force the producers to blacklist the named reds out of all films. It would force them to abandon the making of red propaganda films. As I stated, that objective could have been the cure for the red conspiracy in Hollywood. But I promptly pointed out to that committee that their procedure was all wrong that they were making their organization vulnerable to destruction by the enemy. By the enemy, I meant Motion Picture Producers Association and their chief ally, the notorious Anti-Defamation League. They asked me to explain how and why they would be so vulnerable. My explanation was very simple. The enemy would simply launch a campaign to terrorize the supermarkets and all other merchants to boycott the products of the husbands of that committee of 100 women. All those women scoffed. They said the enemy just would not dare to attempt such a boycott. Several days later, it happened. One of the committee, whose husband was the head of one of the largest dairy companies in Southern California, frantically withdrew her club from the organization because her husband's business was threatened by the very boycott scheme I had warned against. 
During the following two weeks, approximately 60 additional panicked members of the committee withdrew for the very same reason. In addition, Rupert Hughes, then in the late 70s, stated that the job of advisory chairman was too strenuous for a man of his age, and he resigned. Thereupon, Mrs. Orme and the remaining members of the committee called me into a meeting and asked me to tell them how they could carry on. They were determined not to surrender their objective. My advice was simple. Their objective was to educate all of the American people about the Red Menace in Hollywood and unite them into destroying that menace. Therefore, the name of their organization must distinctly emphasize that objective. And I suggested a new name, the Cinema Educational Guild, also to make the organization, CEG, invulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, the committee of the presidents of the women's clubs must be disbanded, and the names of the new directors of CEG and of the members of the guild must never be revealed. Thus there would be no targets for the enemy except myself if I became the head of CEG, and I would be invulnerable. The enemy could do no more to me than they had already done. Mrs. Orm and the others agreed, and that was when and how the Cinema Educational Guild came into existence. And at this time, let me stress that ever since then, I have continuously been stressing that the Reds never surrender, that they never let go of anything they have in their grip, that when unmasked and cornered, they retreat, they smile, they offer to coexist, and I've continuously warned that the moment the victim lets down his guard, they, the Reds, pile in more ruthlessly than ever. The Moscow Reds confirmed all that in Hungary in 1956. Remember? In short, the Reds can't be licked. They must be destroyed. But there's only one way to do it, through their pocketbooks. There must be a nationwide boycott of all theaters that show films with red stars or films with red propaganda. Kill such films at the box offices and you will destroy the ammunition, money of the producers. The same is true of radio and TV in a different yet similar way. The moguls of radio and TV do not have to depend upon box offices for their revenue. They depend upon the sponsors who pay for the time to show their TV shows and commercials that advertise their products. A nationwide boycott of the products of such sponsors will quickly cure that disease. It will keep those red stars and red propaganda shows out of your living rooms. Shows that poison the minds of your easily influenced children. Time after time after time, we drove the Reds out of Hollywood. The people assumed that they had achieved a great and final victory. That the whole war had been won. And then they'd proceed to forget. And the Reds would come slithering back. There is absolutely no doubt that a fully alerted people can kill this Red conspiracy in Hollywood. Let's go back to that first hearing in Washington. The reactions of the suddenly aroused American people to the revelations at that hearing swept panic through all of Hollywood. Mayor, Warner, and all the other panic-stricken moguls piously vowed that they would immediately begin a drive to house clean all Reds and Red traitors out of Hollywood. Of course, they lied. Despite their fright, those moguls had no thought of reforming. They merely determined not to be caught again. Actually, however, they couldn't have reformed even if they had truly wanted to, which they didn't. Because the real controls of Hollywood are firmly in the hands of such internationalist bankers as Lehman Brothers, Kuhn Loeb, Goldman Sachs, the Warburgs, etc., who financed practically all the big Hollywood lots, all of whom are directors and the top brass of the Council on Foreign Relations, the hierarchy of the great conspiracy. Practically every Hollywood lot, every national TV network, every national radio network was financed and is controlled by those internationalist bankers, and therefore all of them are controlled by the CFR. That entire story of the enslavement of our entire mass communications media and all their betrayals of the American people is fully revealed in our Illuminati CFR recordings. The brazen sham of all those promises and pious vows of the moguls at that first Washington hearing was clearly revealed after the infamous Hollywood Ten were released from prison. The moguls had faithfully promised that none of those ten would ever again be employed by Hollywood. 
but immediately after their release, all of them were restored to their old jobs under fictitious names and at double their previous salaries. Naturally, we, CEG, turned all that evidence over to the FBI and the Congressional Committee. But even more important, after about a year of disappearance from Hollywood, many of the Congressional exposed stars, such as Frederick March, Gene Kelly, Humphrey Bogart, John Garfield, Edward G. Robinson, etc., were back on the lots and getting the best roles in Hollywood. We waited for action from the Congressional Committee, but no action came. So we, CEG, decided to do a job of reminding the people in our own way. I wrote and CEG published a book which I called Red Treason in Hollywood, in which I revealed the full story of the Red Conspiracy in the film industry, and I named all the top Red stars, writers, directors, and producers. That was the first time that such a complete and direct charge had ever been published, and so many of Hollywood's royalty named as traitors. The book created a sensation. It even caught the press off guard. Editorial writers and syndicated columnists, among them, believe it or not, Ed Sullivan, who acclaimed the book as a Bible for those who want the truth about conditions in Hollywood. Sullivan stressed that the author's background in the theater in Hollywood gave the book an authenticity that no outside writer could have provided. But our press holiday didn't last very long. The notorious Anti-Defamation League, who had previously warned me of dire consequences if I persisted in my exposition of the Red Conspiracy, came roaring into the battle. They issued an order, and all the Red, Pinko, and Liberal publications began a hysterical screaming of anti-Semitic, basing their screams on the fact that there was a heavy percentage of Jews among the Red traitors I had named in the book. The ADL did not deny that those individuals were Reds and traitors. That apparently did not matter. My crime was the naming of them, and within a matter of days, both the press and radio were completely closed to us, even for paid advertising. All bookstores and even libraries were terrorized into blacklisting the book. In addition, they terrorized the printer we had employed into refusing our reprint orders and into destroying all plates of the book. That has happened with all our books, and the moguls blithely continued to employ all the reds and brazenly continued to issue red propaganda films. Right then and there, I learned the answer for the red disease in the film industry. The blackouts by the press and radio kept the people completely in the dark about what was going on in Hollywood. True, that congressional hearing of 1947 had revealed it, but that was more than a year previously, and the tragic short memory of the people had made them forget all about it. So right then and there, we, CEG, adopted a new technique to break through that blackout. We organized picketing committees to picket the theaters showing the Red Stars and Red Propaganda films. To provide TNT ammunition for the pickets, we issued a special six-page tract which contained the salient features of Red Treason in Hollywood and a listing of the Reds. We made them available at the rate of $2 for 100 tracts, and they are still available. Within a few months, more than 2 million copies of that tract were in circulation throughout the nation. In Newark, New Jersey, a war veterans post had its members picketing the premiere of a new Charlie Chaplin film and killed it for the entire country. In Los Angeles, we picketed to death the death of a salesman and other red films. In Chicago and other cities, the American Legion and veterans of foreign wars did similar jobs. The press just could not or did not dare to ignore the picketings. And once again, our story became a front page sensation. Theaters all over the country canceled their bookings of all the picketed films. And the panic was really on. The Frederick Marshes, Eddie Cantors, John Garfields, Orson Welles, and many of the Red Stars named in our tract became poison at the box offices. Receipts zoomed down in all theaters, showing such stars. Theater owners all over the country began to scream, and that brought on another congressional investigation. That did it. 1947, my production of The Play Thieves' Paradise had forced a congressional investigation of the Reds in Hollywood that sent the infamous Hollywood Ten to prison and drove many of the other unmasked Red Stars out of Hollywood. But within a year, 
the people had forgotten, and all the rest came pouring back. Then early in 1949, our CEG new technique of picketing the theaters, combined with our Red Star's tract, reminded the people, and once again the Reds were driven off the screen. But as I will show you, the short memory of our people again and again enabled the conspirators to restore the film as their great brainwashing propaganda weapon for our destruction. However, that second show of Cleaning House by the Moguls came almost too late for the film industry in Hollywood. During the following two years, the entire industry was in its greatest depression. Every month, hundreds and upon hundreds of theaters were closing their doors, which meant alarmingly reduced revenues for the producers. By 1951, the situation was more than just acute. It appeared that the entire industry was headed for a big bust. Important stockholders were asking embarrassing questions, and more than merely hinting that changes at the top might be the cure. The moguls and their masters, the internationalist bankers, became more and more desperate. Something had to be done to bring the American people back to the box offices. The only way to accomplish that was by doing something to make the people once again forget about the Reds in Hollywood. Here is how they went about it. They resorted to an old trick. During the Depression years, 1929 to 1935, the surest cure for anemia at the box office was a personal appearance of a popular movie star. Many movie theaters owed their survival to that lure. So now the moguls decided to resort to that same technique to hoodwink the American people. Only this time they added a twist to it. In addition to appearances at theaters, the stars were to be honor guests at the luncheon meetings of women's clubs, Kiwanis, Rotary, Lions, and other civic and service groups. In addition, and that was the real gimmick, they were to entertain and address press conferences attended by all local editors and columnists and radio and TV commentators. And under strict instructions, the theme song of all those traveling goodwill ambassador stars was to be, communism has been cleaned out of Hollywood. I stress that under strict instructions, because I know that many of the Loyal to America stars vehemently protested against that phony theme song. For one example, Clark Gable, the most popular of all the Hollywood stars, positively refused to serve as such an ambassador, and the moguls didn't dare to punish him for it. On the other hand, there were other Hollywood celebrities, and they were those who screeched Americanism the loudest, who jumped into the scheme with both feet. One of the most shameless of these renegades was Ronald Reagan, then president of the Screen Actors Guild, which at the 1947 hearings in Washington was proclaimed to be the most vicious hotbed of communists in the entire film industry. The same Reagan now is governor of California and a would-be candidate for the presidency. He toured the nation and spouted his brazen deceit on radio and on TV before all types of civic groups. And he didn't stop with the statement that communists and communism had been cleaned out of Hollywood. He assured the world that, quote, today even the fellow traveler has disappeared from the Hollywood scene, end of quote. Now in order to clear away all doubts and confusions about Reagan's hypocrisy, and to show the depths of deceit to which he resorted, the following is a sample of one section of his spiel as it was published under his byline in Victor Rysel's column on July 27, 1951. Quote, Communism, stated Regan, failed in Hollywood because the overwhelming majority of the Screen Actors Guild are and always have been opposed to communism. They, the Reds, tried every trick in the bag, but the actors, led by the board of directors of the Screen Actors Guild, outfought and outfought them. We fought them on record and off the record. We fought them in meetings and behind the scene. Our red foes even went so far as to threaten to throw acid in the faces of myself and other stars, so that we never could appear on the screen again. I packed a gun for some time, and policemen lived at my home to guard the kids. But those days are gone forever along with the deluded red sympathizers and fellow travelers. Today, even the fellow traveler has disappeared from the Hollywood scene. End of quote. Now bear in mind that the overwhelming majority of the Screen Actors Guild and Board of Directors mentioned by Regan 
contained hundreds of the stars named in our Red Stars crack, all documented as Reds by the Congressional Committee and the California State Senate Fact-Finding Committee. That new theme song worked like a charm. As was to be expected, newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV picked it up and spread it throughout the nation. The liberal columnists and radio and TV commentators began to chorus it in their columns and broadcasts. They loaned their columns and their mics to Regan and the other Hollywood goodwill ambassadors, and public opinion once again began to succumb to it. The people began to forget, and slowly but surely, the starving movie theaters, which had been showing the Red Stars and Red Propaganda films, began to fill up again. By 1952, it seemed that all the people had forgotten, and Hollywood was on its way back to prosperity, and all the unmasked and banished Reds came flocking back onto all the Hollywood lots, and they again gleefully began to produce films with messages. And that was their great mistake. Had the moguls kept the banished Reds out of Hollywood two or three years longer, had they kept messages out of their films for two or three years longer, and continued there today even the fellow traveler has disappeared from the Hollywood scene theme song, they might well have succeeded in lulling the American people so deeply into slumberland that, figuratively speaking, only an earthquake would have awakened them. But the masterminds of the CFR are not concerned with the problems of their mogul tools and stooges. They want continuous action, continuous brainwashing, and the Hollywood moguls had to obey orders. Thus, even as their theme song, No More Reds in Hollywood, was ringing throughout the land, they again began to issue red propaganda film after red propaganda film, each one more brazen than the previous ones. We promptly issued another special bulletin in which we fully revealed the Hollywood mogul's new technique. We categorically listed all the new red films, and we highlighted the propaganda in them. We again named all the once banished Reds who were back on the Hollywood lots. And we again stressed the return of the infamous Hollywood 10 into their old jobs and revealed the fictitious names under which they operated. Within 60 days, we had more than 200,000 copies of that special bulletin and more than 2 million copies of our updated Red Stars tract circulating throughout the country. And once again, theaters all over the country were being picketed. Once again, the House Committee on the Un-American Activities was being deluged with copies of the bulletin and tract, together with angry letters demanding action. And despite all pressures to prevent it, the committee publicly scheduled another Hollywood hearing. And lo and behold, once again, the press was forced to the front page another parade of Hollywood celebrities to answer questions. Again... Many of them, when asked the $64,000 questions, hastily sought refuge behind the Fifth Amendment. Others, realizing that we, CEG, had provided the committee with documentary evidence of their red activities, and fearing the consequences of perjury, such as had sent the Hollywood tent to prison, confessed and named virtually all those we had listed in our Red Stars tract, many of whom were again holding down the best jobs on various Hollywood lots. Naturally, that torpedoed the Ronald Reagan Act. It also sank all the other Hollywood goodwill ambassadors. They all scurried back to Hollywood and into deep silence. And once again, all the Reds were in flight from Hollywood, back to Broadway in Europe. And this time, they had a new sanctuary, television. But once again, hundreds of theaters all over the country were going out of business. Now you would think that that new debacle would have served as a final lesson for the moguls. But as I have been repeating for 20 years, they never quit. Actually, I repeat, they can't quit, even if they wanted to, because they are the slaves of the masterminds of the great conspiracy, the internationalist bankers of the CFR, who are concerned with nothing less than the complete brainwashing of the American people. So even as Hollywood was reeling from the latest exposure, once again, the conspirators began to develop another new technique. And this time, they acquired some truly amazing cat's paws to do their job for them. It was a fiendishly clever scheme, which they figured would whitewash all their reds and restore them as idols of the American people. It was a scheme that truly was Machiavellian, 
How Machiavellian is evidenced by the fact that the new cat's paws they chose to pull their chestnuts out of the fire were none other than our most highly trusted syndicated columnists. Columnists whose loyalty to everything American until then had been beyond question in the minds of all our people. When Ronald Reagan's, today even the fellow traveler has disappeared from Hollywood, phony act was unmasked, it was fully revealed that the press was, collectively, the major villain in the piece. The major actors in that Ronald Reagan phony crusade were all the syndicated movie gossip columnists who had continuously, mawkishly rhapsodized over the fallen angels, plus such columnists and radio TV commentators as Drew Pearson, the Alsops, Ed Murrow, Chet Huntley, Eric Severide, Howard K. Smith, etc. But all such journalists had long been unmasked as willing collaborators of the CFR Great Conspiracy, which of itself made it easy for us to unmask that entire theme song plot. But there is another group of columnists and commentators who in those earlier years wielded a tremendous influence on public opinion, who in fact molded public opinion. The best known of them were George Sokolsky, Fulton Lewis Jr., Westbrook Pegler, Victor Reisel, etc. The Reds derisively and bitterly referred to them as isolationists and vicious rightists, which clearly established them as loyal Americans in the minds of the American people. The vast majority of our people virtually revered them, regarded them as oracles, and blindly responded to every word they wrote or uttered. In the main, that was fine. In the main, I readily subscribed to the integrity of all in that group. And when they stuck to the things they knew, I wholeheartedly subscribed to their wisdom. But I refuse to have blind faith in everything that anybody says, and especially in what they don't say. Personal equations in every man's affairs forbids that kind of blind faith. For one example, when Truman appointed Anna Rosenberg to be Assistant Defense Secretary, Fulton Lewis Jr. revealed her entire background in a series of broadcasts. Then the notorious ADL threatened him with their well-known anti-Semitic brand blackmail pressure, and Lewis completely reversed himself and gave her a complete clean bill of political health by broadcasting that the Anna Rosenberg he had been unmasking was a different Annie. He knew that was false, yet he deliberately misled the American people. He admitted he did that because he had been warned that the ADL would pressure his sponsors to cancel their sponsorships and thus drive him off the air. He was faced with the choice of deceiving the American people or losing his voice on the air. He chose to save his voice. Another prime example, Victor Reisel delivered his column to Ronald Reagan to lie to the American people that today there are no Reds left in Hollywood. Reisel knew that was false. Yet he deliberately let Regan delude the American people through their blind faith in him, Rysel, and in the words of his column. I could cite other examples of slips by otherwise loyal to America columnists and commentators. I don't know why they made and still make those slips. Pressure may have forced some to do it. Mawkish sentimentality may have swayed others. With still others, it may have been sheer ignorance about a subject which they had no right to touch. But whatever it was and is, it proves my contention that blind faith in any fallible human being, and believe me, all humans are fallible, can be as dangerous as was our blind faith in a Franklin Roosevelt who betrayed us at Pearl Harbor and at Yalta, or at White Eisenhower who delivered Berlin and all of Eastern Europe to Moscow's armies, or a United Nations who deliberately murdered our sons in Korea and Vietnam and who will continue to murder our sons with similar betrayals. Anyway, it was that type of trusted columnists that the Hollywood moguls and the masterminds of the great conspiracy chose to whitewash their red stars and brainwash the American people all over again. This came to my attention during the early months in 1953. It came in the form of letters from various TV sponsors who defended the employment of such Reds as Frederick March, Edward G. Robinson, Eddie Cantor, Gene Kelly, etc., in their TV shows. The gist of such letters from the sponsors was that their stars were no longer in the Red category because they had been cleared by a highly respected clearance committee, which also had forgiven those Reds past sins. 
Some sponsors also stated that virtually all of the stars listed in the Red Star's track had thus been cleared and that the track was no longer valid. That highly respected clearance committee puzzled me. Such clearances, to be authoritative, could come only from the FBI or an official congressional committee. In response to my inquiries, all such official agencies denied having issued such clearances. Nevertheless, that same clearance story was more than just merely hinted by various columnists and commentators. And late in 1953, the people again began to let down their vigilance. All picketing ceased. Circulation of the Red Stars track began to greatly decline. Protests to sponsors greatly diminished. And the Red Stars began to creep back into Hollywood and flooded into TV. And once again, Red propaganda films became the order of the day, and I still didn't know the identity of that highly respected clearance committee. But early in 1954, a George Sokolsky column let the cat out of the bag. The first paragraph of that column reads as follows, I quote, For two years, Hollywood has been surprisingly clear of communists. After motion pictures were boycotted and theaters picketed by patriotic organizations to prevent American money from filling the treasury of the Communist Party, a program was set up which gave the dupes, or innocents, or even the communist who had changed his mind, an opportunity to clear himself. About 300 persons connected with the industry took advantage of this opportunity to set themselves straight. Surprisingly few of these persons have backslid. It was a good record of work done to help an industry in distress, and it must be said that the principal producers cooperated with the program. End of quote. Wow, what a brainwashing lie. What a brazen plot. I say that because we had named approximately 300 Red Stars writers, directors, and producers. The House Committee on Un-American Activities had named the very same 300. Needless to say, it was that same 300 that Sokolsky and his so-called clearance committee whitewashed in his column. That let the cat out of the bag. It gave me the clue to smoke out the whole plot. Briefly, here is the story. During the congressional hearings following the exposure of the Ronald Reagan spiels that today there are no more Reds in Hollywood, George Sokolsky and none other than James O'Neill, publisher of the American Legion magazine, organized a small, very select group of syndicated columnists into what they called a clearance committee. Naturally, it was done under pressures from the Hollywood moguls, the ADL, and the CFR's controlled newspaper publishers. The modus operandi for the clearance was simple. All that any individual, whether it was a Lucille Ball, a Katherine Hepburn, an Edward G. Robinson, or an economy-driven fellow traveler had to do was write a letter to the committee saying that he or she had seen the light and he or she was immediately absolved of all sins and all Hollywood and TV and radio network sponsors were confidentially informed of that fact. It was all done very hush-hush, but by the time we got on to that little scheme, all the Reds who had been officially cited as such were in possession of clearance certificates. And to give nationwide credence to the clearances, many columnists and editorial writers eulogized some of the most flaming Reds for having seen the light, for their honest confessions, and for their earnest, phony pledges to sin no more. Some of them even appealed to the public, as George Sokolsky did, to forgive the repentant sinners, such repentant sinners as Dalton Trumbo, John Howard Lawson, Otto Preminger, the despicable Stanley Kramer, etc., Small wonder that TV sponsors could blandly state to protesting customers that the Reds in their TV shows were no longer Reds because they had been officially cleared by that clearance committee. Small wonder that Hollywood and TV producers could brazenly reject criticism of their employment of Reds on the ground that their Reds had been cleared. Small wonder that the brainwashed all over again people began to let down their guards and cease their picketings and protests. Small wonder that all the Reds were once again flocking back into Hollywood. Perhaps the most brazen of all the apologists for the Reds was that same Ronald Reagan. After we had torpedoed his There Are No More Reds in Hollywood, he was rewarded with the job of producer of TV shows for General Electric Company, whose head is a member of the CFR. He employed some of the most flaming Reds to star in those shows, and he introduced them as one of my best friends and a great American. 
Today, he is the governor of California and running like mad to become the Republican candidate for the White House. Aside from the fact that actor Regan knows as little about running a state or federal government as I do about piloting a submarine, if he gets into the White House, will he likewise eulogize the Ho Chi Minh's, Mousy Dung's, and Brezhnev's as he eulogizes Red Stars in his General Electric TV shows? No doubt he would. While I am on the Regan subject, I will mention another very significant matter. Many Americans who will hear this record may recall that in the very late 1940s, the masterminds of the Great Conspiracy set up a one-world organization which they called the United World Federalists, more commonly known as the UWF. The job this UWF was set up to do was to bribe and seduce 32 state legislatures to secretly pass resolutions memorializing Congress to transform the United States into a unit of a UN One World Government. By July 1949, they, the UWF, had succeeded in getting 26 state legislatures to secretly pass that treasonous resolution. All they needed were six more states, and our country would have become an enslaved unit in that UN One World Government. It was in that month of July 1949 that we, CEG, launched a statewide crusade to force the California legislature to haul out that UWF resolution for an open to the public review, exactly as Congress should haul in the UN Charter for a similar review. How we, CEG, accomplished it is a story in itself and has no place in this record, but accomplish it we did. And in March 1950, the California legislature reviewed the UWF resolution, declared it an act of treason, and rescinded the resolution, the first time such a thing had been done in the history of California. The other 25 state legislatures, in fear of the reactions of their constituents, promptly followed California's example. That's how close we came to lose our country. Only the fight put up by the Cinema Educational Guild saved us. That UWF outfit of treason was organized by 42 of the most notorious and flaming Reds in the country. But my chief reason for mentioning that incident is that Ronald Reagan was through the years a member of the board of directors of that UWF cabal of treason. And he is the man who wants to be the president of the United States. While I'm at it, there's another point. Mrs. Ronald Reagan, known in the Hollywood professional circles as Nancy Davis, joined a score or more of Hollywood Red Hot Reds in signing an amicus curiae which contained a plea for clemency for Dalton Trumbo and John Howard Lawson of the infamous Hollywood Ten. And she too wants to be a first lady of the land in the White House. Shades of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. But now, back to that clearance committee. As soon as we had all the facts, we, CEG, again roared back into the fight. We issued a special bulletin in which we hurled back into the teeth of Sokolsky, James O'Neill, and their committee colleagues all their brazen lies that for two years Hollywood had been surprisingly clean of communists and communist activities by naming more than a score of films issued during those very two years that befouled America even more than did mission to Moscow. As on previous similar occasions, we flooded the nation with that special bulletin, and as before, a reawakened and infuriated people came roaring back into the fight. Once again, they employed our Red Star tracts, millions of them, to force a showdown with Hollywood, with TV, and with Congress. So once again, we beheld a parade of the Red Stars, writers, directors, producers, before a congressional committee. Among them, all those who, according to the clearance committee, had expressed sincere regret for their past misdeeds and had vowed never again to become involved with communistic activities. But there were no expressions of repentance or recantations when those supposedly cleared reds appeared before the Congressional Committee. When asked the various $64,000 questions, they all jumped behind the Fifth Amendment. Naturally, those hearings torpedoed the phony clearance committee and the equally phony clearance certificates. They torpedoed all the alibis of the sponsors and the producers. And once again, we beheld a hasty exodus of panic-stricken Reds out of Hollywood. Now, unquestionably, many Americans who will hear these records, but who never read any of our news bulletins and special bulletins, or have not seen our Red Stars tracked, will be amazed by all of the revelations in these records. They will probably find our revelation of that clearance committee plot unbelievable because of the men involved in it, especially a top official, James O'Neill, 
of the American Legion, an organization created and dedicated to work for the safety and security of our country. But it is all a matter of official recording in the congressional records and front page reportings of those years. Why such previously highly regarded men lent their prestige to such a dastardly plot, whether they were pressured, intimidated, or bribed into it is unimportant. The point that is very important is that they did it, and that others of equal standing have been, and are being, caught red-handed in similar activities. And that brings me to the point I wish to stress in this record, and to show why this record is invaluable at this time. Ever since 1949, our Red Star's track, reinforced by our bulletins, has been the one, the only one, impassable roadblock to the Reds and the CFR's complete conquest of Hollywood, TV, and radio. But since the late 1950s, there have been no congressional investigations of Hollywood and TV, hence absolutely no front page alertings. Whether the congressional committees have been bribed, seduced, or intimidated, the fact remains that there has been no official investigations of the Reds in Hollywood or in TV or in radio since 1956. As a result, today both Hollywood and TV are again seeding and crawling with Reds. The Catherine Hepburns, Lucille Balls, Frederick Marches, Edward G. Robinsons, Dalton Trumbos, the Melvin Douglases, all the Reds we had driven off the screens big and little are back again and tragically the vast majority of the American people seemingly have forgotten the communist backgrounds of all those many time exposed Reds and are flocking to their films. And seemingly, they, the people, do not realize that the films they are patronizing and supporting today are even more viciously communistic than Song of Russia, Gentleman's Agreement, Mission to Moscow, and all the Red films of earlier years. And even more horrible, during the past ten years, they have been producing films directly aimed to destroy the morale of our nation, particularly our youth. Films that glorify hippies, that eulogize and encourage racial strife. Films that subtly encourage lawlessness and riotings in the streets. In short, every kind of film that glorifies communism and denigrates Americanism. Each one produced, written, and directed by Reds. Each one starring flaming reds who had been driven off the screen time after time after time. I do not have space or time in this record to name the scores of red propaganda and filth films now being shown all over the country and throughout the world, but I will name one that has just been released. The title of it is Look Who's Coming to Dinner, a filmization of one of the most salacious books ever written. It was produced and directed by Stanley Kramer, one of the most flaming reds in the film industry. Its stars are Catherine Hepburn and Sidney Poitier, two of the most flaming reds in Hollywood. This film depicts the love story of a black boy and a white girl. In the telling of it, the black man, portrayed by Poitier, is endowed with all the virtues and human decencies, whereas the white man, played by Spencer Tracy, who recently died, is depicted as a vile, racist, and bigot. And this is just one of many such films. All devoted to one objective, destroy the American way of life. In the preceding record, I stated that television is even a greater menace to the security of our nation than the press and the Hollywood films combined. The reason for that is that TV brings that menace right into our living rooms, into the minds of our utterly unsuspecting teenagers and the brainwashed older people. I stress the fact that the Reds operate in TV without the slightest restraint. From its inception, TV has been brazenly flaunting in its shows all the Reds whom until recent years, not even the despicable Otto Premingers and Stanley Kramers dared to bring back to Hollywood. Moreover, from its inception, TV has been flaunting even more brazenly red slanted shows and sex filth shows that destroy the morale of our teenagers even more brazenly than Hollywood ever did, and has continually been bringing them right into your homes. Bear in mind that all the Reds we drove out of Hollywood always promptly found a home in TV. Also bear in mind that TV also became a springboard for the later, the younger flaming liberals, such as Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward, the Smothers Brothers, and others of that ilk. Furthermore, 
The moguls of TV always gave and still give their producers, writers, directors, and actors a completely free hand to inject poisonous red propaganda and sex filth into their shows in any way they see fit. And much of it is craftily designed to influence the minds of your children. It is common knowledge, at least in the profession, that a red director, a red writer, or a red actor even if he were under strict orders from the head of the studio not to inject communism or un-Americanism or subversion or filth into his show, can easily subvert that order by a look, by an inflection, by a change in the voice. In Hollywood, during those periods when they were being exposed by the congressional investigations, the studio heads did issue such orders. But the heads of all the national networks do not and never did prohibit red propaganda. The vast majority of the American people will consider that last statement to be utterly unbelievable, but I am sure they will change their minds and understand why TV is so brazenly treasonous when I will reveal the names of the men who own and control all the national radio and TV channels. I established that practically all of the Hollywood moguls, such as the brothers Warner, Louis Mayer, Skank Brothers, William Fox, the Cones, Zucker, etc., were refugee fugitives from the pogroms of Russia, Poland, Romania. But far more important, I established that all such moguls actually are and always have been the tools of the internationalist bankers who are the masterminds of the internationalist communist conspiracy to destroy our nation. Well, the very same conditions apply to the so-called moguls of radio and television. Their masters are the very same internationalist bankers who control Hollywood. Now let me give you a quick rundown on just how the internationalist banker conspirators achieved a control over both radio and TV. Radio as we know evolved from the Marconi wireless in the last year of the First World War. The internationalist conspirators quickly realized the vast potentialities in that medium to the minds of the people and they promptly moved in to get control of it. To get that control, their key tool from the very outset was one David Sarnoff a young refugee from Russia. He now calls himself Brigadier General David Sarnoff. This Sarnoff, after serving as an office boy, was Marconi's secretary when the first voice was heard on the air. Marconi, completely absorbed in his inventions, had no time for business. He left all such details to his bright young secretary. And Sarnoff was a bright young man. The bankers quickly realized it. They also realized that in young Sarnoff, they had their ideal tool. Thus, when they set up the financial structure for the Radio Corporation of America, commonly known as RCA, they installed Sarnoff as the president, king of radio. In our Illuminati CFR recordings, I described in detail the methods the internationalist bankers employed and continue to employ to get control of Hollywood, of radio, of TV, of the press, even of political conventions. But for the benefit of those who have not yet heard those earlier Illuminati CFR recordings, I wish to clarify that when I say the bankers, I mean Kuhn Loeb, Jacob Schiff, the Warburgs, the Laymans, Bernard Baruch, Goldman Sachs, all the internationalist bankers. Only one banker, such as Lehman Brothers, may mastermind the financing and setting up of a film corporation or a radio TV network or a newspaper chain, but all of them participate in it. All of them are partners in it, and they hold all control within their own conspiracy group which is best known as the Council on Foreign Relations. In this conspiracy, they are one for all and all for one. For one example, when with the help of Woodrow Wilson and several renegade senators, they slipped that Federal Reserve Act over on us and became the masters of our money system, virtually all those bankers came here as immigrants, but not in the true sense of that word. Jacob Schiff, August Belmont, the Laymans, the Warburgs, came here not to seek refuge, but to mastermind the great conspiracy to enslave our nation. And they came here equipped with unlimited funds provided by the Rothschilds to set up the machinery for that plot. From the very outset, RCA had a complete monopoly of the airwaves. But we do have an antitrust law in our country. And while the conspirators have nothing but scorn for our laws, because they control our lawmakers, they felt it necessary to keep the people from knowing that they had that monopoly. So they decided to camouflage their monopoly. First, they set up the National Broadcasting Company, the NBC. Next, they set up the Columbia Broadcasting Company, the CBS. Then they set up the American Broadcasting Company, the ABC. 
Thus we had three national networks, which on the face of it were three completely competitive outfits, but all controlled by the same gang of internationalist bankers who are the masterminds of the great conspiracy to transform the U.S. into a unit of their U.N. One World Government. To leave nothing to your imagination, I will describe the supposed ownership of CBS. When Jay Paley supposedly set up CBS, his secret partner was Herbert Lehman, and the Lehman Banking House is still the chief owner and controller of that network. At this point, it may be of great interest to look into the background of the Paley's. When the original Paley, grandfather of William Paley, present head of CBS, fled the pogroms in Poland and brought his family to America, his name was Polinski. After trying several jobs, he got a job in a cigar factory. Like all such refugees, Polinski was industrious and ambitious. Within a few years, he set up his own little one-man cigar factory. Evidently, he was a good cigar maker. His La Polina cigar, as he had named it, became very popular. In the years that followed, Polinski and his by then grown sons expanded their operations until the La Polina became one of the largest of the independent cigar manufacturing operations in the country. Then came that Wall Street operation that merged most of the independent cigar factories into the American Cigar Company, commonly called the Cigar Trust. The La Polina was one of them. The Polinskis, who had meanwhile shortened their name to Paley, retired from the cigar business with a fortune running in the millions. It was during the negotiations for the sale of their cigar business that they got to know the Laymans. Their purchase of CBS, with Herbert Layman as their majority partner, followed, and that was when the Paleys became pledged stooges of the Illuminati CFR conspiracy. The background of the ABC network is very similar. The owner of record of ABC is the Paramount Pictures Corporation and as established in our Cinema Educational Guild's news bulletins and in the Illuminati CFR recordings, Paramount Pictures Corporation is, and always has been, controlled by the laymans and their allied internationalist bankers of the CFR. And all the supposed heads of Paramount, the Zuckers and the Balabans, are pledged stooges of the masterminds of the great conspiracy. Do I have to say anything more to show who controls the airways in America? the air that belongs to the American people. TV is the youngest of our mass communications media. It is unquestionably the most powerful of all of them. This has been amply evidenced in the political campaigns, both national and local, during the past 15 years. Why is it the most powerful? Because it brings all of its propaganda, all of its deceits, all of its brainwashing right into your home. Today, there are more than 50 million TV sets in the United States, and that number is being increased every day. TV hourly brings the up-to-the-minute news into your home. But from its inception, the newscasters have been the Ed Murrows, the Chet Huntleys, the Brinkleys, the Drew Pearsons, the Howard K. Smiths, the Eric Severites, and hordes of that ilk, all of whom are free to color and slant their news in any way they and their masters, the CFR, see fit. Throughout all the hours of the day and far into the night, TV brings all types of so-called entertainment into your home. Shows for the grown-ups, shows for the kids. But the writers, actors, directors, and producers of all those shows are free to inject propaganda for communism and international one-worldism. The more craftily they infiltrate their poison, the more highly are they rewarded. In addition, there are the late and late, late TV shows. In the main, those late shows are old movies, starring such notorious reds as Edward G. Robinson, John Garfield, Frederick March, and others of that ilk. Thus, even all the old reds who now are dead are brought back to life with all their poison on your TV set. Thus, your TV set is the great conspiracy's pipeline right into your home. All through the day and night, it pours its craftily camouflaged, and in many cases not even camouflaged, treason into your living room. It is there to poison the minds of your children right under your very eyes. It is there to delude and dope your mind with pleas for liberalism, for humanitarianism, for brotherhood, always in the name of peace, to induce you to surrender your country to enslavement in a communist UN one world government. In short, your TV set is the great conspiracy's thinly camouflaged saboteur in your home. And there are 50 million such saboteurs in 50 million American homes. 
That means that your TV set is a far greater menace to your country than all the armies of Russia and Red China combined. It is a greater menace than all the tanks and submarines and hydrogen bombs of Moscow. It is the enemy Abraham Lincoln meant when he said that if America is ever destroyed, it will be done from within. And as long as the TV and radio channels remain in the control of the Sarnoffs and the Paleys and the Laymans, our TV sets will continue to brainwash our people and finally pipe piper us into the great conspiracies UN One World Enslavement. Now there may be some bemused doubting Thomases listening to this record who will say that all my warnings are too far-fetched for belief. They will even point out that the licenses of all the TV and radio channels are controlled by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. And after all, they will say, our own FCC would never permit such misuses of our airways. Well, the one thing these doubting Thomases may not realize is that the FCC is controlled by the man in the White House who appointed them after the CFR has secretly approved them. If you still doubt that the FCC is completely controlled, ask yourself why the FCC has constantly refused to grant a license for an independent TV radio station to anybody but Lyndon Johnson in that Johnson area in Texas. And that is why we, the people, must drive the Reds out of TV. The Reds named in our Red Stars tract and at the same time smash the great conspiracy's control of both TV and radio. The FCC won't do it for the same reasons that the Sarnoffs and the Paleys won't do it. The man in the White House who appoints the men on the FCC won't do it. Congress won't do it because the politicians don't dare to offend the masters of TV. But the people can do it by uniting and following the directions I will provide. They are the very same directives we employed to smash the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood by hitting the moguls in their pocketbook. The Hollywood moguls depend upon the box offices of the theaters for their revenue. In 1947, they had 100% control of all the theaters in America. All the major lots directly owned huge chains of theaters. In addition, they controlled all the independent theaters through a gimmick they called block booking. Under that block booking gimmick, the independent theater was forced to buy all the films of the distributor with whom he dealt. In other words, if he wanted the Warner Brothers good films, he had to accept a mission to Moscow and all the other Warner Pro Red films. The same rule applied if he dealt with MGM or 20th Century Fox or any of the other moguls. But with all that control, they were licked when that 1947 congressional investigation created such a public uproar that it caused millions of theater patrons to shun all theaters that were showing red stars and red propaganda films and thus kill their pocketbooks. The frightened moguls promptly promised a clean house and they did stop employing reds and they did stop producing red propaganda films. But they did it with tongue in cheek. They theorized that after the uproar died down, the people would forget and then they could go back to their red conspiracy business as usual. And that is exactly what happened. The people did forget. The press and radio helped them to forget. We have that job of driving the Reds out of Hollywood to do all over again. But at this point, I want to show you how we can do that very same kind of a job on radio and TV. They too are vulnerable through their pocketbooks, but in an altogether different way. In a way, the TV tycoon is in a very enviable position insofar as his source of revenue is concerned. And that goes for radio, too. He is not dependent upon box office receipts or rentals to theaters. His one and only revenue derives from, speaking collectively, the merchant, the manufacturer, the industrialist, commonly known as the sponsor, who, again speaking collectively, pours billions of dollars into the coffers of TV to pay for the free shows and his commercials to advertise his products. Thus, the TV and radio tycoons can and do scornfully ignore the protests against the Reds they employ. It is known that thousands upon thousands of such protests constantly pour into the offices of the national TV and radio networks. All go into the wastebaskets. And when any TV mogul does deign to answer a protest, it is usually in insulting verbiage, challenging the intelligence of the protester. To a somewhat lesser degree, that is also true of the independent local telecasting and broadcasting stations. Thus it is obvious that protesting to the TV and radio moguls is a waste of time and effort. 
It is only one place where protests can have any real effects, the sponsor. But to be at all effective, the protests to the sponsors must be identically the same kind of protests that closed the thousands of theaters that persisted in showing red stars and red slanted films. Because except for a few, very few, the sponsors are not much concerned about the Reds who are employed in the shows and commercials they pay for, or the treason propaganda that is injected into those shows as long as they continue to sell their products. At this point, let's not overlook the local broadcasting station. As we know, each of the national networks maintains one wholly owned station in every metropolitan area. But in the larger cities, there are, in addition, anywhere from three to seven or eight independent local stations. So, just as the Hollywood producers depend upon the local theaters throughout the nation for distribution of their films, so do the national networks and channels and the sponsors depend upon the local broadcasting stations for their nationwide showings of their weekly TV shows, such as the brazenly vicious communist propaganda carriers Mission Impossible, The Invaders, The Defenders, East Side, West Side, the old red-starred, red-slanted old movies, and the Louis Lomax talk shows. Most of the local TV and radio stations are owned and operated by local owners. But except for local news and local shows, all of them are serviced by the national networks, exactly as local newspapers are serviced by the Associated Press and other press wire services. But there's one vital difference. The newspaper can and often does cut and or delete a wire service story as the editor sees fit. But in radio and TV, only the editor of the national network can cut, delete, or distort the news or the verbiage of an address. The local broadcasting station must deliver to the public exactly as it receives it from the network. In other words, we cannot look to the TV and radio moguls and local broadcasting stations for a cleanup of their communist propaganda. We cannot look to the flagrantly leftist and controlled FCC for a correction of that evil or to the traitor in the White House, or even to voluntary action by Congress. When we first launched our project to drive the Reds out of the film industry, we found it to be such a terrific all-out job that we did not attempt to include radio in the then-infant TV in our crusade. But as the banished Reds flocked into radio, many of the more alerted Americans, particularly the club women, took it upon themselves to cleanse radio. A slow but ever-increasing stream of letters began to bombard various radio sponsors protesting the employment of the Reds we, C.E.G., had unmasked in our Red Stars tract. That finally took on such proportions that the press, muzzled though it is, was forced to take notice of it, as shown by the late Hedda Hopper when she published the following item in her then-nationwide column. I quote, a prominent star with a pink reputation appeared on a leading show a few weeks ago. The sponsors got so much protest mail, they're now looking into the activities of every actor they cast in their shows. When listeners stop buying the product, that hurts, unquote. That last line, when listeners stop buying the product, that hurts, is the tip-off to the American people. It is the one surefire weapon that can smash the internationalist bankers and CFR control of TV and radio and drive all the Reds off the air. With that knowledge that the sponsor is our real target, it behooves all of us to know all about him. Actually, there are three kinds of sponsors. But first of all, let me point out that very few sponsors have of their own accord objected to Reds and or Red propaganda in their shows. The wiser sponsors, or I should say the more astute merchandisers, when warned by public disapproval of the Reds and fellow travelers on their programs, began to carefully screen their talent. But there are others, tragically some very top drawer ones, who whether misguided by their advertising agents or influenced by the supposed drawing powers of certain names, have continued to hire notorious Reds. Then when the mail brought floods of protest, such as a sponsor, sought to placate the protesters with various types of phony alibis, and this continues to this very day. Some of the alibis were, and still are, patently tinged with leanings to the left. This particular type of sponsor usually sharply retorts that he is interested only in his star's histrionic qualities, not in his ideologies. 
Then there is the alibi in which the sponsor patronizingly informs the protester that he, the sponsor, is quite an expert on communism, that he had discussed the matter with his star and found him to be a very fine American who is merely somewhat inclined to liberalism, which, the sponsor says, is frequently mistaken for communism. Then there is the third type of sponsor, who is frankly greedy for a high ratings name. This sponsor is very short-sighted. He is selling his customers short, because even his regular customers can readily be transformed into indignant boycotters by a continuous employment of red and fellow traveler entertainers. I can point to a number of red stars and newscasters, Chet Huntley for one outstanding example, whose ratings indicate millions of viewers and listeners, who nevertheless are positively poisoned to the products they advertise. Our files contain proof that many TV viewers go out of their way to buy products at higher prices rather than patronize the sponsors of Reds and fellow travelers. Naturally, the various excuses and alibis are varied, but the vast majority of sponsors, coached and advised by the networks, have always had one feature in common, a challenge to the protester to prove the actual guilt of the star or writer or director in question. Yes, the sponsor admitted he had read Red Treason in Hollywood. He acknowledges that in addition to the Red Star's tracts, he found a star's name in various listings of Reds. He even acknowledges that he has vaguely heard from other sources that his star leans to the left. But where is the proof, demands Mr. Sponsor, that he has actually participated in Red activities. He further points out that while Fagan included his star in the Red Star's tract, there's nothing in the tract or in his, Fagan's books, that pins communism on his star. It is quite possible, the sponsor triumphantly emphasizes, that his malign star was just a dupe, or was labeled a red because of a tendency to tolerance and liberalism. Hence, contends the sponsor, in the absence of documented proof of actual participation in red activities, he sees no reason why he should deprive himself of a highly desirable entertainer. That statement by such a sponsor is phonier than a lead dollar, because right in the Red Star's tract, there's a specific statement that every individual named in the tract had been tried by the House Committee on Un-American Activities and found guilty. There's absolutely no doubt that without the acquiescence of the sponsor, neither TV or radio would ever have become a sanctuary for the banished Hollywood Reds. By acquiescence, I do not mean the liberal sponsor who knowingly and deliberately gives preference to the Reds, nor the rapidly pro-Red sponsor who, to whatever degree he can, actually blacklists the loyal to America actor, writer, and producer. The acquiescent sponsor, ideologically speaking, is neither fish, flesh, nor ordinary red herring. He is not pro-Red, and if you accuse him of being even remotely less than pro-American, he will sputter righteous indignation. But he does not permit love of country to hamper him in his business affairs. He is swayed, or so he says, by the fact that the TV mogul can favor him in many ways, not the least being a desirable time slot for his shows. Therefore, when the channel chieftains suggest a red star for his shows, he feels obligated to acquiesce. There is still another way that this type of sponsor maintains his good relations with the TV powers that be. Very few, if any, sponsors produce their own shows. They or their advertising agents contract with professional producing studios that specialize in TV work to do the job. Studios that have the blessings of the TV moguls. There are a number of such blessed studios in Hollywood and New York. In Hollywood, the two most favored by the three national networks are Screen Gems, owned by Columbia Pictures Corporation, and Desilu Incorporated. In New York, the two most favored are MCA Review and Theater Guild. The reason for such preference is, as you shall see here, quite obvious. MCA has for many years been the mammoth theatrical agency in America. They first appeared as agents for actors, writers, directors, bands, and orchestras. A listing of their clients through the years has been virtually a who's who of the Reds in the entertainment world. MCA has a very close affiliation with the Anti-Defamation League. Do I have to say any more about MCA? The Theatre Guild was for many years a famous producer of Broadway plays. The founders of Theatre Guild were Teresa Helburn and Lawrence Langner. 
They launched it during World War I, and their backers were Jacob Schiff and Otto H. Kahn of Kuhn Loeb & Company. Theater Guild produced all of the U.S. Steel Corporation TV shows, as well as shows for other TV sponsors. Naturally, by the very reason of their Schiff Kahn financial backing, all Theater Guild shows have been always heavily larded with reds. Desilu is the outfit that was spawned by Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. At first, Arnaz headed the outfit, but after their divorce, Lucille became the president and she acquired the old RKO studios. It is a matter of record that Lucille Ball was a registered card-carrying communist, that her home for years was a nesting place for communists at which many red projects were hatched. When all that was revealed in 1947, Lucille plaintively explained that it was all her dear old grandpa's doing. It seems, according to her explanation, that at that time, even though she was a full-grown 24-year-old woman who had been smart enough to forge her way into stardom, her crafty old grandpa had done all her thinking for her. And, so she wailed, it was that old devil grandpa who had been used her into all her communist activities. Anyway, after poor old Grandpa had gone the way of all flesh, our little Lucille came to her senses and eschewed communism and all of its horrendous complications. So she said. But apparently the poor little darling is completely colorblind, because during all the years that followed, practically the entire Desilu staff of writers, directors, producers, also many of the actors have been and are flaming red and as evidence that the powers that be in TV see no wrong in such brazen support of communism, in last year's Emmy Award proceedings, little Lucille was proclaimed to be the greatest actress in TV. Endeavoring to be fair, I will say that not all TV shows employ red stars or contain red propaganda. The Westerns, particularly those depicting the events of the 19th century, are intended to be sheer entertainment. To a considerable extent, the same may be said of some of the private eye or detective series. But with few exceptions, all the other weekly hour shows and special events, such as the Huntley Brinkley, Howard K. Smith, and David Susskind specials, are loaded with craftily camouflaged red and one-word messages. In many cases, they do not even try to employ camouflage. It is impossible in the limited space of this record to name all the message TV shows. But I will name a few that might serve to reawaken our slumbering people. Among them we have the Invaders and Mission Impossible, the latter running at this very time. It is produced by Lucille Ball's Desilu, and the Defenders and East Side West Side that were driven off the TV screen three or four years ago. I mention these seemingly defunct shows not only because they were the worst of all, but at this point for a far more important reason. Both are scheduled to be brought back this year. The TV moguls figure that by now the people have forgotten why they had been driven off the air. The Defenders was launched with great fanfare seven years ago. The pre-publicity about the series was intended to have us believe that two humanitarian lawyers had dedicated themselves to right the wrongs inflicted on innocent victims of vicious persecutions. Persecutions perpetrated not only by other men, but also by some of the inhumane laws in our Constitution. The two lawyers, a father and son team, were portrayed by E.G. Marshall and Robert Reed, two mediocre actors, but whom the TV moguls heralded as TV stars. In its first season, the Defenders played it safe. The messages in those early shows were very faint, hardly discernible to the unpracticed eye. There was a prime reason for that. The producers were making time until the show achieved prestige and high popularity. Each individual show was put together with high professional skill. It truly was excellent entertainment. And by the end of that first season, the Defenders was an eagerly awaited hour in the vast majority of American homes. In the second season, the producers became a bit bolder, but still not enough to stamp the brand of communism on the series as a whole. But in the third season, they threw all caution to the wind, each one more and more brazenly defending communists and communism, each one attacking our laws and our way of life. As we know, the internationalist communist conspiracy has never relied on just one strategy 
to achieve its goal of one world conquest. To the contrary, they are continuously weaving a hundred different plots and pushing their attacks on a thousand different fronts. In its third season, the defenders employed that very same technique. Each week's show was devoted to an attack on a different phase. In short, by the end of that third season, the defenders became the theme song of the conspiracy. I will cite just one of the defender shows in its third season to give you a clear picture. In that show, the chief character was a famous war hero, an admiral, accused of an attempt to set himself up as a military dictator of the United States. It was left to the audience to decide whether that admiral, depicted as senile or mentally touched or both, was General Douglas MacArthur or General Edwin Walker, or a combination of both. Anyway, that admiral, outraged by the treason being committed by various heads of our government, had tried to induce other generals and admirals to join him in an exposition of the traitors. The admiral is betrayed by his own son, who, according to the story, was motivated by loyalty to country, and he, the admiral, is charged with plotting to destroy our present form of government and replace it with a military dictatorship. Of course, he is placed under arrest and is up for trial as a subversive. The son, despite his betrayal, strangely enough appeals to the Prestons to defend his father. They eagerly accept the assignment. In a preliminary discussion with their client, the Prestons urge him to enter a plea of guilty on the ground of insanity and throw himself on the mercy of the court. The Admiral angrily rejects their advice. Nevertheless, at the trial, the elder Preston eloquently pleads for mercy for his client on the ground that it had become mentally deranged by his war experiences. In the midst of that plea, the Admiral burst into a furious denunciation of that kind of a defense and reiterated that what had been called a plot to create a military dictatorship was nothing more nor less than an effort to enlist other loyal generals and admirals into an exposition of the treason being committed by the State and Defense Departments, by the CIA, and other federal agencies. The Preston sadly chuck chuck. Naturally, the jury brought in a verdict of guilty, although insane, and the Preston sorrowfully admitted that in view of the Admiral's outburst, no other verdict was possible. Can you see the point in that TV show? It was a warning that anybody, but anybody, who will dare to point suspicion against a Kennedy, a Johnson, a Rusk, a McNamara, or any Washington official, will be judged insane or subversive and thrown into an insane asylum or prison. And this is the series of TV shows that will once again be brought back into your living room, now that you have forgotten about the communist sabotage in them. By the way, do you realize that we have a defenders organization in real life in our midst in the American Civil Liberties Union? Now to complete my revelation of what a horrible menace TV is to our country, to our people, and to your children, I will cite the East Side West Side TV series of shows. Six years ago, CBS, inspired by the success of the Defenders, launched an outright Pity the Poor Negroes TV series, which they called East Side West Side. This series was intended to serve as a TV conscience of the unconscionable American white people. Its hero was George C. Scott, portraying a frustrated social worker, frustrated because ostensibly the white racist are so ruthless and so utterly unconscionable. According to one heart-bleeding newspaper critic, I quote, Scott and his camera went on field trips into all varieties of despair, and on two distinctly memorable occasions it touched the very heart of Negro frustration. The episodes are shows, entitled Who Do You Kill and No Place to Hide, were both as dramatically wrenching as they were sociologically exact. What is more, they were witnessed by 50 million people at home with their own consciences, unquote. The theme song of the entire series was a heart beating protest against the vicious persecutions of the poor Negroes. They eulogized the whites who joined in the Negro agitation and so-called nonviolent demonstrations as humanitarians. That series of shows even provided alibis for all the Negro gangs 
who rode the New York subways and attacked and murdered white men, women, and children. According to those shows, all those gangs were composed of Negro youngsters ranging from 16 to 50 years of age. Youngsters who had been made desperate by the persecutions of the white races and that all their murderous attacks, looting, rapings, and murders were merely outbursts of righteous indignation protests against the persecution. As for the whites who had been maimed, raped, and murdered, according to the show, they were racist to have baited and driven the poor, persecuted Negroes into their protest. Indeed, the show proved that all the whites, male and female, who in defending themselves had injured or killed Negro attackers were such criminals, and the police who interfered with the Negroes' outbursts of righteous indignation were guilty of police brutality. Of course, much of all this was carefully camouflaged by clever innuendos, but not enough so to delude intelligent viewers. Now here is the most incredible irony and brazen audacity of the entire East Side, West Side series of shows. In the words of the press TV critics, that series of TV shows was a superb mirror for all of the American people. They hailed it as an eloquently humanitarian appeal for justice and civil rights for the centuries-old persecuted Negro race. The same critics loudly proclaimed the East Side, West Side shows were the most popular TV series in the entire nation and had achieved one of the highest ratings of all TV series. That was an outright lie. The truth is that the East Side, West Side series of TV shows never achieved even a fraction of the millions of viewers and ratings claimed for it. Its very first episode made it clearly obvious that that TV series was intended to create racial strife, to incite and inflame Negroes throughout the nation, to encourage and urge every type of lawlessness by the Negroes so as to advance the cause of communism. I repeat, the accolades and claims of popularity by the TV press critics and CBS publicity departments were brazen and outright lies. That was so startlingly apparent that even before the third show was released, the entire nation was in an uproar. The people in approximately 30 southern cities and communities revolted in mass. They flooded all their local TV stations with our Red Stars tracks and demanded that their stations discontinue their showings of the entire vicious series. The merchants joined in the people's demands by boycotting the products of the sponsors of that East Side, West Side TV show, and the stations bowed to their demands. The same thing happened in many communities in the North, in the Midwest, and the Far West. The people forced their local stations to discontinue the series. And that despite CBS threats to withhold all national programs from their stations. But the stations ignored that threat, and CBS did not dare to go through with it. Nevertheless, the CBS continued the series throughout the 1963-64 season. They were determined to cram it down the throats of the outraged American people. However, as a result of a nationwide outcry of the people and their boycott of their products, all the sponsors of that series, except the Philip Morris cigarettes, canceled their sponsorship. But the press continued to collaborate with CBS to the very end. They even awarded their National Television Critics Best Film Series Awards to that viciously treasonous East Side, West Side series of TV shows. But on the day following the award, CBS sadly announced the folding of that series. They acknowledged that the cancellation by all the local TV stations and the sponsors, forced by the people in our Red Star track, had resulted in unsold commercials that lost CBS more than $2 million for the season, which shows what the people can do when they set themselves to do it. But what makes what I have just told you all the more shocking is that CBS, figuring that by now the people had forgotten all about the matter, are planning to bring East Side, West Side back into your living room. Oh, sure, they won't be quite as brazen. They will play the purely humanitarian and the poor persecuted Negroes gimmick so as to create sympathy instead of outrage. But the objective, racial strife, will be the same. Now, the Defenders and the East Side, West Side TV shows are not by any means isolated cases 
that prove the power of the people to control the TV moguls. I will cite two more cases of how the enraged American people forced two of America's most powerful industrialists, both controlled by the Illuminati CFR, to cancel their sponsorships of Red Star TV programs. I will start off with the Texaco Company, how that outfit stubbornly continued to sponsor Chet Huntley after Chetty Boy had been exposed as one of America's top liberals. Liberals being the word all Reds used to camouflage their treason to our country. In 1949-50, Huntley was a newscaster and commentator on one of the Los Angeles radio stations. When we, CEG, launched our crusade to force the California legislature to rescind the United World Federalist Resolution, Huntley, aided by Irwin Cannon, editor of the Christian Science Monitor, launched a vicious attack on the Cinema Educational Guild and myself, claiming anti-Semitism for trying to destroy the peace movement of the UWF and the UN. That attack came at the behest of the Anti-Defamation League, best known as the ADL, whose hatchet man in Sacramento, the notorious Art and Samish, had masterminded the secret passage of that UWF resolution by the California legislature. The UDL made the mistake of proclaiming how our Chet Huntley did a great smear job on anti-Semite Fagan. The same loyal Americans who were supporting our fight for the rescission of the UWF resolution promptly got busy on all of Huntley's sponsors. They flooded them with our Red Star's tracks and bluntly warned them that they would boycott all their products as long as they would continue to sponsor Huntley. The panicked sponsors promptly canceled their sponsorship. That really frightened the heads of the broadcasting station, and they quickly fired Mr. Huntley. For two years, Huntley was a gentleman of forced leisure. No other station in his Los Angeles area dared to give him a job, but the ADL did not completely abandon him. They waited until the furor died down, and then Huntley was rewarded with a job on NBC as a national broadcaster with Texaco as his chief sponsor. We promptly forwarded copies of our The Chet Huntley Story, which we had published in 1950, to both Texaco and NBC. Both ignored it. Thereupon, we revealed this new turn in the Chet Huntley story in a special bulletin. Immediately, many of our Red Star's tracks in the special bulletins began to pour into all the Texaco offices and service stations, accompanied by warnings that all Texaco products would be boycotted if they continued to sponsor Huntley. Those protests came not only from individuals, but from the heads of large trucking companies. At first, Texaco ignored the protests. But as the warnings and rejected credit cards mounted in volume, the Texaco Public Relations Chief prepared a form letter in which he assured the protester that he and NBC had carefully examined Mr. Huntley's background and found that all of Fagan's allegations were false. That was a very stupid alibi, because every so-called allegation had been painstakingly documented in our special bulletin. Hence, instead of deluding the customers, it only heightened their fury, and more and more Red Star cracks and rejected credit cards kept pouring into all the Texaco offices and NBC, and then came the most shattering blow of all. The good and loyal American people in Shreveport, Louisiana, practically in a mass, plastered a boycott on every Texaco station in the city. That boycott practically put Texaco out of business in that area. Now, that should have brought the Texaco officials to their senses, but it didn't. Their public relations department increased their attacks on CEG and Myron C. Fagan. NBC did likewise, and Chetty himself joined in the attack. He publicly proclaimed that he would enter libel suits against Fagan and everybody else who would dare to boycott Texaco. Of course, he never carried out his threats. Finally, I took the step that brought the whole matter to a head. I wrote a personal letter to the president of Texaco in which I called his attention to all of the Texaco form letters and the whole Huntley story. I also told him I was preparing another special bulletin in which I would reveal the entire Texaco Huntley NBC matter, that I would make that bulletin available to all the Texaco stockholders, of which I had a list, and also to patriotic groups in various communities throughout the nation who might well see fit to follow the example set by the good people of Shreveport. That did it. I received a prompt reply in which the president assured me that he had been utterly unaware of the entire matter. He also informed me that there would be no more such actions by Texaco's public relations department. And far more important, 
that he would immediately cancel Texaco's sponsorship of Jeff Humphrey. And he did. And it was all due to the action of an awakened and an aroused people. Of course, what I have just stated is not the end of the Chet Huntley story. The ABL and CFR cannot afford to lose a TV tool as valuable as the Huntley man. So they and the NBC promptly provided new sponsors for his program. But let me assure you, Huntley and his masters are not invulnerable. If you, if all loyal Americans, will continue to bear down on each succeeding sponsor as you bore down on Texaco, even NBC will finally conclude that Huntley is too virulent a case of smallpox for the entire network. Now here is my one and only reason for providing this record. I want to do what I can to alert all of the American people to what Hollywood and TV are doing to destroy our nation. It is now more than ten years since the Congressional Committee has held an investigation of this cancer. Without such an investigation, there will be no front paging to again unmask the red conspiracy in Hollywood, in TV, in radio. As a result, our present growing generation doesn't even know what a cancer Hollywood and TV is. The only way to get them to know it, the only way to reawaken the older generation, is by way of this record and by our Red Star tracks. It is the only way to make all of the American people know and realize that unless we drive all the Reds out of Hollywood and TV, unless we destroy this more dangerous than a hydrogen bomb instrument of the masterminds of the great conspiracy, it will destroy our nation. This record should be a must in the home of every loyal American. Your teenage children should hear this story. It should be played to groups of friends and neighbors in your home, to study groups, women's clubs, American Legion and VFW Post. It should be played at all civic group meetings. It should be played to every Sunday school class for the enlightenment and alerting of your children. It should be played in every church to alert all the people. Now, earlier I stated that there's only one way to smash this red conspiracy in Hollywood, also in radio and TV, and that is through the pocketbook. Earlier I described how that 1947 congressional investigation forced a front-page reporting that drove the Reds out of Hollywood. I also described how in 1950, after the people forgot and the Reds flocked back, we organized the picketing committees and circulated our Red Stars tracts nationwide and once again starved the box offices and forced another flight of the Reds. We did it again in 1953. But since then, there has been no congressional investigation, no front-page revelation. The people once again forgot, and all the Reds are back in Hollywood again. But that very same technique will work fully as well today as it did in 1953. It will again force Congress to investigate. It will once again force the press to front-page such an investigation. It will once again close all theaters that are again showing Red Stars and Red Propaganda films. It will once again drive all the reds off the screen. So I earnestly urge all of you who hear this record to organize picketing groups in your community. Picketing just two or three theaters will create front page publicity that will alert your entire community. Also, serve notice on your local theater managers that you will not only not patronize their theaters if they show just one red propaganda film or a red star film or any un-American film, but that you and your neighbors will picket the theater and thus create a general boycott by all the loyal Americans in your community. Meanwhile, distribute copies of our Red Stars tracts throughout your community to show the people what stars, writers, directors, and producers are documented red and should be boycotted. That technique did a great job once. It drove Charlie Chaplin out of our country. It drove all the reds off the screen. It can and will do it again. With your help, get a Red Stars craft into the hands of everybody in your community. Believe me, if just a dozen theater patrons serve such a warning on their local theater owner, that theater owner will become a 20th century Patrick Henry in his choice of the films he will show. Remember, the salvation of our country is at stake. The futures of your children and grandchildren are at stake. Get the story in this record told throughout the nation. And be sure to tell it to your theater owner. Do it for the love of God, of our beloved country, and for the salvation of your children. Some of the most stubborn sponsors we have encountered are Texaco, Timex, General Electric, Pepsodent, 
Luther Brothers, and the Ford Motor Company, among others. But now let me show you how you, the people, once aroused, cured Ford Motor Company, undoubtedly the most rabid and the most brazen of all of them. That last charge about Ford should not be surprising in view of the general reputation of the Ford Foundation and its notorious offshoot, the Fund for the Republic. In efforts to offset the stench of that fund and the resultant damage to his business, Henry Ford, grandson of the founder, who truly was a fine and loyal American, made many pretty speeches in which he wailingly deplored the activities of the Fund for the Republic. He continually stressed that he and the Ford Foundation never at any time had any control over Wonderboy Hutchins and that other renegade, Paul Hoffman. But he never explained why he made Hoffman his administrator of the Ford Foundation in the first place, nor why, after that facsimile of Alger Hitt became too hot for the Foundation, he gave him and his Wonderboy Hutchins $15 million without any strings tied to the grant so that they could set up the Fund for the Republic and continue their efforts to destroy the United States. Now I shall completely unmask Mr. Ford by revealing his direct collaboration with the Red Conspiracy and TV, by citing the Sunday Night Ed Sullivan Show as a concrete example. For many years, Ed Sullivan was a columnist of the Walter Winchell Stripe on the New York Daily News. His column was syndicated and published by many newspapers all over the country. Shortly after my book, Red Priest in Hollywood, was published in 1949, Sullivan reviewed it in his column and eulogized it as a great work for the salvation of our country. He blasted all the Red Stars named in the book, the same Reds named in our Red Stars tract, and urged all his readers to get the book which he described as a Bible for those who want the truth about the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood. He stressed that the author's background in the theater gave the book an authenticity that no outside writer could provide, and many thousands of his readers followed his advice promptly bought the book and joined in the fight to drive the Reds out of Hollywood. That created a panic. The masterminds of the conspiracy had to find a way to present any additional eulogies in the Sullivan column. Thus, shortly after that incident, the Ford Motor Corporation offered to sponsor a Sunday night hour-long TV show for Sullivan with certain provisos. Ed had always been stage-struck. He eagerly accepted the offer. And from its inception, the Ed Sullivan Show was a haven for all the Reds in the entertainment world, particularly the exposed Hollywood Reds. Throughout the following years, virtually every one of his shows starred one, two, and even as many as six of the Red Stars listed in Red Treason in Hollywood. And in our Red Stars track, the very stars he had blasted in his column. Not satisfied with that, his column now carried vitriolic attacks on the vicious people who had created a blacklist against poor defenseless actors such as Catherine Hepburn, Orson Welles, Eddie Robinson, and various others listed in our Red Star's craft. And then he topped that off with a column in which he appealed to that great, wonderful, powerful, anti-defamation league to help him restore those persecuted stars to public favor and jobs in Hollywood and TV the very same Reds he had previously blasted. We, CEG, promptly issued a special bulletin in which we unmasked the entire Ford Motor and Sullivan plot. Immediately, thousands, hundreds of thousands of our Red Star's tracks, together with that bulletin, began pouring into all the Ford Motor agencies all over the country. The owners of the agencies forwarded all the complaints that poured in on them to Detroit. Ford's Public Relations Department prepared a form letter in which they explained that they had no control of Sullivan's choice of stars for his shows, and they gave similar excuses for the employment of Reds and other Ford-sponsored TV shows. This continued for several years, but it did not turn the trick. More and more people began to boycott the Ford products. Finally, the desperate Ford agency owners met in a special convention in Chicago and served notice on Ford that unless he would do something to cure the situation, they would be forced to close their agencies. That did it. Immediately, the Ford Company announced cancellation of their sponsorship of the Ed Sullivan Show. And simultaneously, Sullivan let it become known that there would be no more Red Stars on his shows. That shows how the people can cure even the most stubborn of renegade sponsors and TV producers. However, 
Don't let that induce you to scratch Ford Motors off your list of red conspiracy collaborators. Because from the very inception of the Negro agitation and street demonstration, the Ford Foundation has continuously financed the Negro rioting organizations and the Reverend Martin Lucifer Kings and other leaders of those so-called nonviolent demonstrations. There is another vital reason for not scratching Ford Motors off that list. In Santa Barbara, there is an outfit that calls itself the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. It is headed by the notorious Wonder Boy Hutchins, and it is frequently referred to as Moscow West, because practically every red operation in this country is first studied and perfected at this Santa Barbara Center. Ford Motors provided this outfit with $15 million and such additional funds that they require from time to time. By the same token, don't scratch the Ed Sullivan TV show off your list of red collaborators. The masterminds of the conspiracy do not dare to abandon Sullivan. He might squeal, you know, so they have to continue supporting his shows by providing other sponsors. And although Sullivan has not been starring the Reds listed in our tracks since that incident, it does not mean that he won't again take up that practice as soon as he and his masters feel it is safe to do so. Now, do I have to further stress that TV is the most vicious and most dangerous menace to the safety and security of our nation? Radio reaches the ears. The press reaches the eyes. The TV reaches both the eyes and the ears of every member of your family. It sugarcoats its propaganda with fascinating entertainment. It educates our youth to view patriotism and loyalty to parents with contempt and even hatred. It imbues them with love of one-worldism and hatred of nationalism. It inspires them to support and join with the communist conspiracy, inspired Negroes in their efforts to destroy the solidarity of our people, and thus advance the internationalist conspiracy to destroy our nation. Moreover, they, TV, don't stop with our youth. They bemuse, bewilder, and confuse the unaware adults as well. They do it with fascinating stories, carefully camouflaged that hypnotize the eye and delight the ear of both young and old. That is why TV is the most terrifying menace of all our mass communications media. That is why TV is the most powerful of all the conspiracy's instruments for our destruction. That is why I say that all the renegade TV moguls should be arrested, tried, and properly punished for the subversion and treason they pipe into our living room. They are operating fearlessly and brazenly under the theory that they are protected by the constitutional right of free speech. But I am sure that proper congressional action will establish that the creators of our Constitution never intended to have freedom of speech permit and protect subversion and treason. However, until Congress does take such action, the most important thing for us to remember and never forget is that we, the people, have in our hands the complete means to utterly smash the Red Conspiracy in TV. The fate of East Side West Side is the undeniable proof of that fact. The same people who hurled that series off the air and put CBS more than $2 million in the red can do the same to any red starred and red propaganda TV shows. The same people who forced the hundreds of local TV stations to cancel the East Side West Side series can do it again and again and again. You have the ammunition with which to do it. Our Red Star's cracks and this record can do a perfect job if all of us will concentrate on it. As you join in this fight to clean TV of the Red Renegade, remember this. The box office was and is the Achilles heel of Hollywood. When the people began to shun the theaters that continued to show the Red Star's it spelled the end of the Red Conspiracy in Hollywood. That smashed the backbone of the conspiracy. Until recent years when the people began to forget and the Reds came pouring back. By that same token, as soon as the people will boycott the products of all the renegade sponsors who employ Reds, it will spell the end. Smash the backbone of the Red Conspiracy in TV and radio. The local Ford dealer is the Achilles heel of the Ford Motor Corporation. The local supermarket is the Achilles heel of a Procter & Gamble, of a Kraft, a Borden, a Heinz. 
The local appliances and utilities dealer is the Achilles heel of a General Electric and a Westinghouse. The corner drugstore is the Achilles heel of a Pepsodent, of a Bristol Myers, of a Lever Brothers. In short, if we, the people, tell the sponsors and their dealers in no uncertain language that if they will bring Reds and anti-American propaganda of any kind into our living room, we will rigidly boycott their products, every such sponsor will quickly become a loyal American. You have the proof of it in Texaco alone. In this fight, our housewives can be our greatest force. If just a dozen housewives notify their supermarkets that they will transfer their marketing to another merchant, if they continue to sell products of a sponsor who employs red, that supermarket owner will promptly cease carrying such products on his shelves. You have all the ammunition you need in the Red Star's track and this record. Watch your TV shows. You will quickly spot the Reds in them if you will have a Red Star's track in your hands. For the love of God and country, fellow Americans, take it from here. It is your country and your children that you will be saving.